Okay, this uh, video is going to be on a um, programming a a first program in microchip using a PIC processor. And I have a couple PIC processors here to choose from. I'm going to use the simplest one possible that I have, which is a 12F675. The reason why it's simpler than the other one here, which looks identical, which is a 12F1612, is because this one right here, the instruction manual or the uh, data sheet is only about 100 pages long. The data sheet on this guy here is like 400, um, just because there's, there's more things inside that chip. Um, both chips are very cheap, by the way, uh, from microchip. You can buy these chips for under a buck, either of them. This one might be 50 cents in bulk, and this would be about 77 cents in bulk. But even outside of bulk, you're paying maybe a buck for this chip, and maybe 75 cents for Actually, <laughs> believe it or not, the easier chip is the more expensive chip because um, people, I guess, had used it in projects and they need replacements or whatever. So that simpler chip is about a buck a piece, and the one that has much more complexity um, is about uh, 75 cents. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can buy them for 75 cents a piece, maybe 65 cents, I don't know. Um, Anyhow, all that being said, I am programming this uh, first project here. I've done many actually, but the beginner project using a PIC Kit 3. Um, obviously USB to my Windows 8 PC, which is also running current software in 2016 right now. Um, it's the MP Lab IDE, uh, I'm sorry, MP Lab X IDE 3.25. Um, that piece of software is um, complete that one program and you get it from a download from microchip it's like a half a gig download and it gives you um, three of these little icons or three little um, programs i'm using the middle one there not all of them for this project it's going to be nice and simple this will be the simplest um first beginner program um video that you'll ever find i guess okay good idea here if you have a chip, you should always have the instruction manual with it. Yeah, you can do it um, if you want from the file, which you can download from microchip, which I have right there as well. It's a little PDF icon, and I can click it open and look at it. But a lot of times it's really nice to have the chip um, or all the instructions in a book because you can write all over it and, and make little notes and stuff. And I don't know, I, I find stuff easier when I tab everything and I can run back and forth between that and my computer program that I'll be running. Um, some guys use dual screens and that's cool. That's, that works. Anyhow, this instruction manual, I call it, it's actually a data sheet. Um, it has a lot of interesting stuff inside that I just want to point out before we begin. This is all the stuff that's inside this chip, the 12F675 that we're going to be using. Um, this tells you all the little tricks and features that it has. And um, Right down here is roughly what it has in the way of memory, program memory, um, data memory, EEPROM memory, and I.O. ports. This chip here has um, six I.O. ports, which we'll be using. And um, just quickly, program memory, um, this has 1,024 words, which means you roughly can do 1,024 instructions inside this chip, which is actually quite a bit. I'm doing assembler, so every instruction is one word, okay, or one byte basically. Um, the RAM and the EEPROM are a little bit different. What We have 64 bytes of RAM, which is basically registers. Um, you have registers to hold information and data. They go in either of them if you want, but the RAM dies and disappears when the chip is unpowered. The EEPROM RAM stays. So if you have some data you want to keep in the chip when the batteries get pulled, you'd put it into E, double E prom. Um, okay, what else? Yeah, the, um, this is also a very useful page. This is the pinout of the chip. That's for a different chip. This is the 675. And it just tells you where all your I.O. ports are. Out of curiosity, GP0, which is the lowest one, all the way up to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And of course, positive voltage goes there, negative voltage goes there. 
I'm running in this example that I'll be doing an internal oscillator so you don't see a place to plug in your your oscillator but you could if you wanted with this chip it allows for it and you just modify the programming to do so um, um, this out of curiosity this pick kit 3 that I'm using the programmer that little red box back there um, the pinout of that to match the pinout of my chip I wrote down here because when you get your little pick kit 3 there's a variety of ways to get it plugged in and I'm rednecking it here by just taking little wires and running from the pinout there to the pinout for my chip that I'm going to be sitting here when I program it. When I'm finished programming by the way I'm going to put the chip in this breadboard and just run it with a little LED that has LED yeah that has a little 500 ohm resistor. Um, interesting note uh, this is running from a USB port to power the PIC kit 3 and yet I need to supply it with 5 volts in order for it to program properly. Um, it's just part of the way microchip works with this particular um, platform but anyhow I've thrown 5 volts on my my 1 pin and my 8 pin just to get the chip to program um, and that's normal apparently and I'll, um, that's, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, what else? Okay, yeah. So, since we're doing assembler, um, also in here, oh, wait, one other thing I want to show you. Um, with these chips, they do something called paging or banking, which means that basically all of your registers are all, um, you know, they follow you around wherever you go, basically, in your program, but the special function registers do not. Special function registers in bank zero, for instance, there's about 32 of them. Um, they have to be banked, or you have to request to jump to a bank of special function registers to use these registers or their features. And then over in bank number one, there's another set of special function registers um, to do a variety of different things. And you can't use these if you're in bank zero because that's bank one. You have to move over to bank one in your program in order to use these registers. Um, and these things, for instance, what I do is, for example, in this program I'm doing, I run over to bank one here and I program register five, they call it 85 here, but, and I program how I want the IO port to be set up. Um, if I put a zero in this slot here in bit zero, it will become an output. If I put a 1 in there, it will become an input. Okay, so that's how they create input-output ports on the PIC processors. So, I set up my port here for digital input-output. Then I can run over to this page here. I rebank back to bank 0 in my program. And I will be able to put data on that chip or pull it off depending on whether it's an input or an output. Okay, and it just shows up on byte 5 on my registers when I want to look for it or add to it. Okay, um, I put a lot of tabs here because it helps to find things. And um, one other thing here, just to show you, this book's falling apart. Status register. Um, keeps track of a bunch of things. Um, there's a lot of a variety of registers. Status register fortunately just follows um, the the banking. So whether you're in bank zero or one, it will always be there. So you don't worry about having to flick over to one bank to find it. But it is used to flick between the banks. All you do basically with um, status register three is if I come along and where is that? <laughs> Oh, here, <laughs> bit 5. Hmm. Uh, if I put a 0 in bit 5 of register 3, voila, it turns to bank 0. If I was to put a 1 in there by clearing that register, I would be then, next instruction, I'd be looking at bank 1. Okay. Um, here's a bunch of other registers, but I just want to point out one thing it, with this manual that you get or data sheets 
you get um, also the instructions, all the instructions for uh, assembler. And really, there's only 35 instructions. Um, I have not used this manual for five years, four years. I've been doing other things. And I can quickly um, get back into assembler because it's a very simple, very small instruction set to learn. Um, they do a variety of different things. That's just the entire list of all the instructions for that chip. Other chips will have maybe 40 or 50 uh, instructions, but this particular chip, the 675, has 35, I think. This is more detail about each one of these little um, instructions. Like, for instance, this one just adds a literal number to a working register, or perhaps um, bit test a file register and skip if it's clear. And there's the syntax or the explanation of what it does. Um, you can call things. You can call a label, which I'll be doing actually. Um, you can clear um, a file register, which I'll be doing as well in this um, little program. And you can uh, you can decrement a register file and then skip if the answer is zero. You can skip the next line. I mean below it. Um, go to, you can go to labels, right? Um, yeah, so this this helps explain everything. Um, put things to sleep. Um, you can return from your... Um, return from what? <laughs> I think it's your call. <laughs> uh, whatever. Okay, yeah, so there's a bunch of stuff you can do here, and that's very useful. Um, so let's see if I can start getting in. Hopefully you've already downloaded your MP Lab. Let me just hit this here, force it to find a focus. Okay, so you've downloaded your 500 megabyte MP Lab XIDE, which has a bunch of letters and I don't feel like figuring it out. Um, dip, double click on that, it'll open it up. And by the way, I am the Pick Kit 3 is plugged in and so it can find it automatically. Get rid of all this junk here, get rid of that, get rid of that, nice clean screen. And let's start off by creating a new project. So um, what you do is um, you go into microchip embedded, standalone project, just a few things you have to click here, click next. Um, and since I'm using a 12F675, I already know it's a mid-range 8-bit processor. But you can find it in this little list down here that I'm going to be using. And what did I say it was? A, six, a 12F675. Hopefully it's not blurry right here. Um, next. Um, a debugger. No, I'm not going to use a debugger. I'm going to make this a really simple, simple um, beginner project. Um, I'm using a PitKit 3. So it's asking which programmer I'm using, and that's what it is. I am using the assembler that came with the download. It's uh, version 3.25 right here. Next, click. Project name, I'm gonna call it um, number nine. Um, test, um, I just throw underscore nine. Now, um, down here, the encoding. Um, set it for UTF-8. That will allow the assembler to encode in hexadecimal. It doesn't mean anything to you, but it just means that the compiler will be able to use the stuff. Okay, so I'm pretty much ready to go. I'm going to be doing a source file, and I am going to do a new file. Okay, it's going to be in assembler, as if they didn't know. And it's going to be a .asm file. Next, I'm going to call it, I don't know, what was it going to call it? Was that a test 8 I entered or in test 9? I don't remember. Okay, test 9. Here we go. Um, and then finish. Okay, so it should be ready to rock and roll right now. So I'm going to start typing out code here and building the program. With this here, I'm actually going to leave some space for a label. Um, hopefully, two will be good. So, um, oops, it's learning to print here. List. Okay, this right here, actually, I'll try and explain the code I'm doing here. Um, 
This is just telling the the um, compiler that I'm going to be using a, a 12F675 so that when it starts to compile it will have some knowledge of what's really happening. Um, obviously this one just tells you the origin of the code will be in um, uh, address 00 in the program memory when it goes into the chip. Um, and then I start in with my code. Actually, I should, why not just put a little space there. Boink. Move literal into W. Um, I'm going to move some numbers around. Actually, you know something? I did save this. So I'm going to, instead of typing it all like, like this, I'm going to just paste it all. How cool is that? Okay, I would have normally typed this out for you, but it, it will take so long when I'm um, just packing it out there. Um, so anyhow, I don't really need a space there, but I'm going to just throw a space there. I'm going to throw a space here so I can explain the code with some spaces between it, okay? Okay, so this code here is what's going to be run. Um, this section up here, this is what the compiler sees. It will never see that code or this code inside your program, inside your chip, okay? All the other stuff here will be inside your chip. Um, if you're familiar with assembler, this looks pretty normal to you, and that's great. Um, the first batch of numbers right here, this, I pretty much put that into every one of my uh, programs I use when I program this 675, because when the chip came from the factory, it wasn't actually set up to run digital. It was actually set up to run with the comparators on and um, a variety of things like that. Um, so I forced it to run digital by programming these first uh, seven lines. And actually I just wanted to point out a couple things here. Remember I was talking about banking between banks one and zero? Well, what this did is um, it assumed that we were in bank zero when it started up. The processor starts up after I've thrown five volts into it. And it, it types this stuff into uh, um, well, it moves a literal into W, which is a working register. It puts the number 7 into a working register, and then moves the W working register into file register 19. And that actually changes the comparators, so they, roll, they run digitally. Um, this right here, bit set file register 03, bit 5. That's actually turning the banking over to bank number one in the special function registers. And in bank number one, I had to change um, the I.O. ports, so I had to set them up. And I set them all up as um, output. <laughs> I could have done a variety of things, but I just set them up, up as output, and I also did a little change with um, the ports, but just to make the thing run properly. Um, right here, I've changed the banking back to bank zero by going bit clear, file register three again, and bit five is now cleared. So I'm back down at bank zero with my special function registers as I explained back on that book. Um, anyhow, so this is the main program right here. Um, I just put start there so I can call it later. It's a label. And the way this works is if you um, tab across, there's certain sections of tabbing that is defined as code versus labels versus data. So my instructions are all in this section here. I didn't actually have to request it that way. It just turned out that way. Um, I could have done three tabs over, six tabs over, and it still work. It just seems to know how to do that. I don't know how it works, but it does. And a few more tabs over, and the code right here, or the data, is all in that side right there. I'm sure I could have done it differently, but I think that's uh, it works for me. So anyhow, anyhow um, this line right here, um, bit set file register 054. 05 is my um, my I/O or my output. So I've just told the output bit four to set to go to one or you know go to high right, which is five volts, and then I called a loop. So basically, the program runs down to label loop, and it runs this little um, nested loop here. If you're familiar with um, uh, assembler, what it's doing basically is 
Uh, it decrements a register. And all registers are 8 bits long, which means there are 256 numbers in, in total that they can do. Um, so anyhow, this will decrement register 20. Oh, come on. Stop doing that. This will decrement register 20. And the 1 just means it throws it back into the register. So um, decrement register 20. Throw that number back into register 20. And, and check if it's 0. If it's 0, um, it will skip over the next line, which is this one. So the term dec fz or sz means decrement file register 20 and skip if it's zero. So obviously um, first time it decrements it'll probably be 200 the number will be 255 and it will look at it and say mm, I have to keep going. So it goes to loop again and it decrements it to 254 and then loops it to 253 and it will run through this little loop here 256 times until finally it sees a zero on register 20 and it says yeah I'll skip so it drops down to here and then from here it sees that it decrements it and it says oh um, it's 255 for this one so it loops back up to here and, and, oh, and repeats again um, it creates a, a long enough delay in this funny little program here, or this little um, sequence here, to create about a, a fifth of a second delay so you can see whether the LED is on or off when the program's running. So anyhow, um, remember I called it from after turning on the LED? Uh, well, now it comes back finally with the return statement right here, and I Bit clear file register 054. So you can see I'm using the same file register 5, which is the I.O. port, and I've now turned the bit 4 off or down to low, which is 0, right? And then I run to that loop and it goes zipping around for a whole bunch more times. And then finally, at the end of all that, um, I go back to start. So this is going to be a this thing's going to repeat forever. Um, by the way, every instruction is basically one byte, as I mentioned, but it's also one quarter of the time of the, um, the, the oscillator. This actually is um, running an internal oscillator, or it will be in about five seconds when I explain how that works, um, on four megahertz. So that means that every one of these lines is run in uh, one millionth of a second, except a call or a, um, a decrement type statement where it has to look at it and move around and choose decisions, they take two. For instance, this decrement statement and this go-to statement, that will take two, uh, it will take three actually. <laughs> so it will run through three instruction counts or machine cycles, what do you call that? Yeah, I guess maybe machine cycles, um, to get through that. So it's 256 times three machine cycles. It's like 750 microseconds to do that section. And then it comes down, does one there. Um, people who count their code and want to know exactly how long it takes things to work, this is roughly what the process of figuring it out. Anyhow, it worked out to about two micros, two milliseconds. No. <laughs> Whatever. Um, two tenths of a second. So anyhow, this code's pretty much ready to run, except um, there's something called configuration bits. Um, we want to set them. So click there, and down in this window here has your configuration bits. Uh, let me just make it a little bit taller so you can look at them. Um, so you've got a variety of things you can do to change the way your processor runs. What I like on this particular example is I'm going to run an internal oscillator so I don't have any of the pins taken up with um, crystals and things and it also frees up more um, pins in that particular example um, the watchdog timer I'm just disabling it it's nothing to worry about yet you can read up on it um, this pin right here I'm changing it over to be used as a digital pin instead of something else and what else am I going to do Bound out, detect, and we'll turn off this just because I like to, it's fun. Um, 
it's just so that <laughs> sometimes uh, if your voltage wanders, it'll go into a, it'll sense that there's something browning out as your power is going dead or something. And it will try to shut down your processor or reboot it or something. Anyhow, that there is the way I want my configuration bits set up so that my oscillator is internal and all the chips, all the pins are all digital. Now, um, this will generate code that will just be looked at by me. So I've just generated some code I'm just looking at. What I see here is this right here, line, config um, 0xF194, that is my configuration bit coding. And I'm going to come up here and enter, oops, oh dear, what did I do here? I lost something. <laughs> There you go. Come back. Okay, so I'm going to ed enter that into my coding to create a way to um, change my configuration bits. So I just um, copy that, which is basically underscore underscore config, and then space along. And what was that number? It was OX. Uh, oops, back up here again. This is a lot of fun. OX, oh, it's going to disappear. Um, okay, so, um, okay, OX F194, okay. OX F194, good thing I learned how to remember things. F194. Okay, so that's my um, configuration bit coding. Now, I'm just going to compile it. So, if you notice, there's a little hammer right here. That's to build the project. So it's going to build that project, which means it compiles it into stuff that the computer can read, or the uh, the chip will be able to use. Uh, you can see it says build success. Great, it's fantastic. Now I'm going to shove it into the chip with this button here, and push that button, and it goes in the chip. It's going to ask me if I have. Um, a three volt or a five volt system, oh, so I just don't care. Um, it's programming it, and it's verified it, and it's complete. Okay, so that program is complete, and we will go over here and pull the chip out of here. Oh, actually, I'll just just get rid of one of these things. It's always best not to have voltage sitting on your chip while you're pulling it. Probably be nice to have a little tool too. So I'm going to be putting into a I, this little breadboard here just to test it out and I figure out how to work this oops okay there you go um, the coding in case you couldn't read my coding this is it right here so maybe that's a little clear I don't know hopefully uh, you understood some of this stuff so give me a comment if it didn't make sense Thanks.